Hello, everyone. After a rainy weekend, nice to have you here for a sunny Grand Rounds on this Monday afternoon. We're thrilled to have with us today Dr. Sumit Singh Mittar, who's a uh, cardiologist uptown, uh, a native of California, spent a lot of time traveling across the country for his studies and also down to uh, Brazil as an NIH Fogarty International Clinical Research Scholar. He's spending a, a lot of his time now researching uh, using advanced cardiac imaging for the detection of subclinical myocardial dysfunction. And uh, in his free time, I guess, he performs cardiac catheterizations and endomyocardial biopsies <laughs> and implants cardio MEMS devices for remote pulmonary arter artery pressure monitoring, uh, talking to us today about hokum and cardiac amyloidosis. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, everyone. Um, uh, very humbled to have this invite. Um, I remember when I was back in medical school, I think there were a couple of things I just did not enjoy learning about, and that were hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and cardiac amyloidosis. And here it is, it's my career now. So um, things change. Um, I think medicine residency re really reentered my appreciation for cardiology and different cardiomyopathies and just how um, the muscle fibers change and lead to pathology, and, and it's now become a passion project. So um, we'll jump in, into some half half phenocopies, hokum and cardiac amyloidosis today, a lot's changed in the field since I was in medical school, and it's at a very exciting time with a lot of clinical trials, and that's what gets me really jazzed about the field, that there's just so much investigation um, at the moment. So a couple objectives are to be able to differentiate between half half phenotypes, hokum and cardiac amyloid, and then also discuss novel diagnostics and therapeutics for both hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and systemic amyloidosis. So first of all, HASPAP, what is that? We have um, a new proposed universal definition of heart failure um, that was put out by the Journal of Cardiac Failure um, in conjunction with our heart failure societies. And you know, traditionally, the nomenclature for heart failure is delineated by the ejection fraction. Um, we commonly think about heart failure in terms of half ref, which is an ejection fraction of less than 40%, but half pep are those patients with an EF greater than 50%. That being said, it's kind of a catch-all, um, but essentially it's these patients with an LV ejection fraction greater than 50% that leads to, frankly, really elevated filling pressures, both at rest and with exertion. And so most of us um, are at this solid blue line. And when we exert ourselves, um, the LV, can expand in order for us to not feel an elevation of filling pressures when we exert ourselves. So you go from the solid blue line to the hashed blue line. But in anyone with a half path physiology or restrictive cardiomyopathy, you move from that solid blue line to the red line. So that any given LV volume, you have higher filling pressures, okay? It's the, the muscle stiff, thickened, and pressures rise quickly. And with half path phenotypes, with exertion, you go from that solid red line to the uh, hashed um, red line here, when the pressure actually rise quickly. And so people have the syndrome of dyspnea. Essentially though, there's a lot of disorders that can lead to this phenotype um, with um, a restrictive cardiomyopathy or half pep syndrome that explain and lead to dyspnea. Many of them often have thickened ventricles, okay? But at, the, at its core, they are different diseases. So these are specimens from autopsy um, thickened ventricles, one being cardiac amyloidosis, hypertensive heart disease, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, well, of course, we try to identify this before someone passes away, and echocardiography, you know, is often our first tool to do that. But in the age of harmonic imaging, which is where we look at an echo and we actually brighten the myocardium to visualize it more, it's harder and harder to delineate some of these diseases from each other because they all look bright and have thick myocardium. Um, so we run into some problems in differentiating focum from amyloid, from hypertension with renal failure to a lysosomal storage disease. In the modern era, many of you have seen reports now describing strain. Essentially, we take that LV, smush it into a pancake, and we look at how the motion of the myocardial fibers uh, work across the whole cardiac cycle. And in a nutshell, red tissue is healthy, and the closer you get to pink or white tissue, that's unhealthy. Uh, tissue. And in these bullseye plots of the left ventricle, when they've been smushed, and we look at strain in different segments of the heart, 17 segments to be exact, um, you know, there are some patterns that we can recognize that help us delineate what those thickened ventricles are. 
The top row here are patients with amyloid, and they often have what's called a cherry on top or apical sparing pattern, where the strain or healthy red tissue is only in the apex of the heart, which is the center here. But as you go up to the mid myocardium or the basal layers of the LV, um, those top chambers, uh, top segments of the LV, the strain actually gets worse. That's closer to a color of zero. And that means the fibers really aren't moving throughout the cardiac cycle or lengthening or shortening. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, what I want to hone you in on is that in amyloid, a lot of those myocardial, you know, those amyloid fibers deposit in the interstitium in the basal and mid layers of myocardium, not so much the apex. So taking that then to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we often think about a diseased septum. This is where you see abnormal strain, okay? That worst strain in the septum here um, <clears throat> on these bullseye blocks. But, you know, apart from recognizing it, um, we have to understand the disease state so we can treat it better, okay? Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease of the cardiac sarcomere. Um, and essentially, you have left ventricular hypertrophy with a wide range of structural and functional consequences. You can have it with um, L left ventricular alpha tract obstruction, which is obstructive hypercardiomyopathy, or you can have HOCOM without left ventricular alpha tract obstruction, which is a non-obstructive phenotype. Commonly, these patients, like other HFPF patients, have fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain, palpitations. Um, there is a uh, risk of sudden death. Um, with these patients, especially as the thickening, uh, the myocardium gets thicker and there's more scar and fibrosis there. And over time, patients can actually burn out their myocardium, meaning the fibers essentially just stretch out and die. And they have progressive heart failure symptoms and may need a heart transplant. But when going back to that definition of what an obstruction is across the left ventricular alpha tract, that is essentially when the pressure gradient in the left ventricular, left ventricular alpha tract is greater than or equal to 30 millimeters mercury. Okay, non-obstructive is less than 30 millimeters. So if we're over here on the LVOT, that pressure gradient there is over 30. You really shouldn't have any. And often this is worse when we do provocative maneuvers like Valsalva. Um, there are a host of genetic mutations that can lead to this um, hypertrophic chromopathy phenotype in the cardiosarcomere. And that essentially we think that may contribute to about 30 to 4% of cases. Um, but essentially what these mutations do, it leads to a hypercontractile state in those areas of diseased myocardium. So the, those hokum fibers, they're just like so activated, okay? They're, the sarcomere is activated and that's why the muscle's thick. And we, up until recently, we haven't been able to reduce that energy activation of the myocardium in this high energy state. Um, in 2020, there was a guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and there's some good flow charts here, pretty simple to follow. But essentially, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, we look if there's obstructive physiology and if they're symptomatic, we try to avoid vasodilators because when you vasodilate the aorta, you're creating um, an accelerated flow across the left ventricular alpha tract, and you'll actually heighten the gradient there, okay? Um, or high-dose diuretics. If you drop your preload, you'll lead to more obstruction um, and create a tighter gradient across the left ventricular alpha tract and patients may feel worse. Um, you have to find a steady balance there. But uh, the main pillars of our therapies for a long time have been beta blockers and verapamil, not to target the sarcomere, but just to slow down the heart rate. So when you slow down the heart rate, you give time for LV filling. Remember, most of we spend about two thirds of our cardiac cycle in diastole. So if you slow down the heart rate, decongest the left atrium and fill the LV, you'll push that thickened septum aside. And that lowers the gradient across the left ventricular alpha tract. And that's what we try to accomplish, but we're not hitting the disease at its core. Um, along with that, if there are persistent symptoms, there are other agents, disapyramide, or we can refer patients for septal reduction therapy, either by surgery or alcohol ablation to basically, you know, kill off those fibers or carve it out to reduce the, the symptoms and the, and the gradient there. So um, I was um, talking to you previously about beta blocks and verapamil not really targeting that diseased thickened sarcomere that's active, um, but we are in a new era with myosin inhibitors. And so the first a class agent on the market that has FDA approval is called Mavicamptin. Um, and so let's examine what the sarcomere looks like. You have normal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy sarcomeres with Mavicamptin. So essentially, you have an actin-thin filament, you have an actin-myosin crossbridge with the myosin-thick filament. 
okay? Normal contractility, effective relaxation. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's a hypercontractile state and impaired relaxation because there's more actin myosin cross bridges, okay? These myosin head, uh, heads are binding the, act, the actin thin filament. So that changes that uh, myocardial ener energetics. With mavicamptin, though, essentially that disrupts some of those bonds with the actin thin filament. So you're in a less active state. It disrupts those bonds. So it attenuates the hypercontractility. You have improved compliance. The heart can relax a little, relax a little bit more because it's not constantly contracting in those, in those areas of uh, the diseased uh, myofibers. And then there's improved energy consumption, uh, energetics within the heart. So there are actually two um, pivotal trials using this agent for obstructive um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy over the past couple of years. Um, and it's essentially to pinpoint our therapy for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at two critical steps. Okay, I showed these flow charts before, but essentially what the Explorer HCM trial was doing was trying to sit there and say is, on top of one of these agents, just monotherapy, um, preferably a beta blocker um, in the initial trials, was mavicamptin superior to placebo in patients on one of these agents to lower the heart rate, um, adding the whole idea of myosin inhibition. Um, the Valor HCM study, and we're going to quickly go into those, is actually targeting at the septal reduction pathway. So for patients who get mavicamptin, does that reduce the need for septal reduction therapy, either with surgery or alcohol septal ablation? Um, to improve symptoms and outcomes. So the Explorer HCM trial was a phase three clinical trial, randomized double-blind placebo, um, exploring uh, Mavic Hampton versus you know, placebo to address symptom hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in adults with a septum of at least 1.5 centimeters, or they could it could only be 1.3 centimeters if there was a known genetic mutation, but patients had to add a peak LVOT gradient of at least 50 at rest or after Valsalva with exercise. Um, they had to be symptomatic, class two to three symptoms. Um, and they only had monotherapy with a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, if the dose was remained stable over the past two weeks. Um, these, this is just kind of a flow chart of what the titration schedule or the visit schedule was, was for the study. Essentially, you screen a patient, you randomize them, they get the placebo or mavicaptum agent, and you have a dose titration um, schedule across multiple visits. And we do all this testing, we look at the echo, we look at, we do surveys for functional classification, if they'll do holters, um, if there is some um, MRI data. And essentially the main out, outcome was to look at changes in NYHA classification and peak VO2 on oxygen consumption during cardiopulmonary exercises. How well can you deliver oxygen to your fibers, to, to your body when exercising? Okay. And, you know, looking at this composite primary endpoint, uh, looking at um, CPET data, peak oxygen consumption, or improvement in NYHA functional classification, the Mavicantin group was superior. Okay. There was more patients um, had an improvement by this set baseline of 1.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute in peak VOT consumption or improvement in NYHA classification. Or, if there's no worsening NYHA classification, they had to go up by three milliliters per kilogram per minute. So the Mavicampton group won. In a lot of secondary endpoints, okay, yes, the functional endpoint is how do patients perform an exercise testing and how do they feel? What they also found was that gradients, um, you know, were reduced more in those patients who got Mavicampton as opposed to the placebo. Um, and they're frankly overall wellness quality of life improved also when we look, use standardized assessments called Kansas City questionnaires, okay, which you guys may have come across before. Um, and this is kind of my favorite um, diagrams from the study when it was published in the Lancet, because often we'll talk about symptoms, peak VO2, but a lot of the tangible things we look for um, physiologically um, are actually our natural peptides, or nt pro BNP, and those patients Mavicampton patients are in blue, okay, placebo are in red. The patients got Mavicampton had a reduction in NT-pro BNP levels over 30 weeks, okay, versus placebo were essentially constant. Um, and then the Valsalva LVOT gradient, okay, that came down 
So these patients in placebo still had an elevated gradient with Valsalva, and those patients who got Mavicantid, despite provocative maneuvers, their gradients came down to less than 30. So as they essentially shifted to a non-obstructive phenotype when they got myosin inhibition and disrupted those active, um, you know, myosin active uh, crosslinks. And in terms of NYHA class, what I'll point you to here is class one is purple, class two is you know red, class three is teal here. And over time, we want to see throughout the duration of study that patients shift from being teal and red to more of this blue here. Okay, and that means that they're coming down from NYHA class two and three to one. And the patients got mavicampi more and more actually hit NYHA class one where they really didn't have symptoms compared to placebo. So now with myosin inhibition in patients for first receptor reduction therapy, essentially these patients did not do well with just beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or disopyramide. And so in a similar studies, they randomized patients to mavicampin or placebo, um, and then they had to be evaluated at the end of 16 weeks if, based on echocardiograms if they met qualifications for septal reduction therapy after they randomized, okay? And so the outcome was to see it was an efficacy endpoint, how many patients were still considered eligible to get septal reduction therapy, did they still meet that endpoint? And it was only 56 patients in both arms, but what you'll see here is, you know, the, in terms of the efficacy endpoint, only 10 patients remained eligible for septal reduction therapy in the Mavicampton group, whereas 43 patients in the placebo group still remained eligible for septal reduction therapy meaning we changed the natural history and the physiology of those patients in the Mavicampton group, and they no longer needed an invasive procedure to ameliorate their symptoms. So, and this is kind of the visual uh, central figure here that shows uh, what we're trying to accomplish. So up here, much like the earlier diagram, we're disrupting those active myosin cross uh, bridges with Mavicampton. And what you see down here is the number of patients who you know, became ineligible, that's the green bar here, for septal reduction therapy was much higher in the Mavicampton group as opposed to the placebo group, okay? 82% versus 23% became, were ineligible at the end of 16 weeks. And in terms of improvement in NYHA classification, in this diagram, you want more patients to shift from yellow and orange to the red group here. And that's what happened with Mavicampton. More patients, had an improvement in two or more classes in which classification. A little bit different than the prior diagram, you're looking at improvement here. And the greater than two class improvement was achieved more with Mavicampton. Nonetheless, one of the feared complications with Mavicampton and myosin inhibitors is that you know, you're disrupting just those, those pathologic fibers, but what if you potentially also disrupt some of the healthy fibers? and then those muscle fibers can't work as well. So one of the feared complications is a drop in ejection fraction. Clinically, we don't know what that means yet, but um, a, in open label extension studies, as we see more patients on treatment longer, um, patients who switched from placebo to Mavicampton or stayed on Mavicampton throughout the Explore H, or Valor HCM trial, um, essentially a number of them had a reduction in their EF to less than 50%. And you know, one patient actually was less than 30% at the end of 32 weeks. So while these studies were like 16 weeks or 30 weeks, as you treat them longer, there could be a greater drop in EF. So with that in mind, these patients, it's not benign, hey, we fix their hope when we give them Mavicampton, yay, win. We there is actually a pretty rigorous screening process to make sure that they're still safe on the medication many weeks out. And it's a pretty regulated uh, dose titration schedule based on the EF and the remaining LVOT gradient after Valsalva at both weeks four, week eight, and 12. And it takes 12 weeks to kind of get to your steady state here, in, in, or sorry, six weeks to get to steady state. But you know we're not trying to do too many adjustments in the dose up through week 12 um, because we don't want to lead to drops in EF that could be potentially harmful. Okay, and then after week 12, there's um, a reassessment of EF, of EF every 12 weeks after that. The next generation product is actually called Afficampton. And um, it's actually was a, made by the same company. Mavicampton was initially made by Cytokinetics and that was sold off to Bristol Myers Squibb. Afficampton is kind of the next generation product also produced by Cytokinetics. And we're actually trial site using this agent for the phase three study. Um, 
where it actually has a shorter half-life and washes out of the body much, much more quickly. And there isn't actually much drug-drug interaction. One of the things with Mavic Hamptons, there's potentially interaction with calcium channel blockers, which would raise the effective um, dose of a calcium channel blocker and potentially lead to toxicity. Um, and so with aficamping, you achieve a steady state after only 14 days of dosing. So as the drug builds up, you'll achieve a steady state and you'll get a physiological response okay, with this drug. Mavicamptin takes six weeks. So it takes a much longer time to get the steady state and titrate up that medication and get a physiologic effect, okay? Um, but also a little bit of aficamptin leads to big changes. You don't need as much of the drug. Um, and so it's a threefold shallower dose response curve versus Mavicamptin. Um, and with the fact that it's easier steady state, shallower dose response curve and less drug interactions, many of us are really excited about, about this agent and that it could, you know, it's helping the field rapidly evolve. Um, and in phase two studies, what I'll bring your attention to here is that um, patients in aficamptin, so the patients who got placebo in the phase two studies are the patients in the, the gray bars here in these top rows looking at gradients and LDEF. And in different cohorts, testing aficamptin, different doses, um, patients who got aficamptin versus placebo, their gradients came down with the rest and with Valsalva. There wasn't too much of a decline in EF at the end of 12 weeks, okay? The jury is still not out. It's only 12 weeks there. But at the same time, those patients who got aficamptin versus placebo, there's reduction in LA volumes. There was less systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. So the mitral valve from the thickened septum is not pulled the apparatus is not pulled, um, creating MR, and there's less MR over time as well, and those patients got aficamptin versus placebo. Um, and similarly to what we showed with Mavicamptin, those patients who got aficamptin had uh, more improvements in NYHA functional classification versus placebo, um, and some patients had a complete hemodynamic response where they basically the gradients melted away, um, as opposed to the patients who got placebo. Um, so that's very encouraging. Um, so the Sequoia HCM study, you know, similar to the Mavicampus studies, Explore HCM, it's a randomized double-blind placebo study. I'm actually blinded. I can't even look at the echoes for the patients in the study. God forbid I find something out or discern something. So we have, we have blinded cardiologists who look at the echoes for me, who don't know what treatment arm is, but they're allowed to look at the echoes. Um, we look at patients with an LVOT gradient greater than 30, post Valsalva greater than 50, you know, NYHA class two or three symptoms, randomized to aficamptin or placebo, um, and it's run over about 28 weeks. Um, we're looking at echoes, functional classification, quality of life, NYHA classification, and we're just doing dose titration over six weeks. Um, the best thing about this study is it's actually only about a six month study, um, as opposed to other uh, ph pharma studies, which could be a year, year and a half. And after six months in a washout period, uh, the company is pledging and standing behind their product that they're actually going to get patients during open label extension free drug for five years. Okay. So that's pretty remarkable because all these drugs for rare diseases can cost a good amount of money, um, especially when there's a monopoly in the market. Um, the primary objective here will be to look at exercise capacity in patients with symptomatic obstructive, obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we'll you know, we'll be looking at peak VO2 on CPET at, from baseline at week 24, and there's a host of secondary outcomes, looking at KCCQ scores, NYJ classification, change in total workload on CPET, and changes in the gradients. All right. Now we'll shift gears to cardiac amyloidosis, one of the things that I have been um, helping build for the system in terms of treatment pathways, uh, referral patterns, getting drugs out of door formulary, um, and just trying to increase awareness about this kind of sleeping giant within cardiology that sometimes we miss, okay, myself included. So cardiac amyloidosis starts as HEF-REF. We showed those restrictive biopathies before. Late stage can lead to HEF-REF, okay? It's often confused with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on echo because it's a thickened ventricle. But if you treat it like HOCOM or for hef -REF risk factors such as hypertension, at late stages of the disease, that treatment can be troublesome or harmful. Um, amyloid patients are very restrictive. They don't have much cardiac output. They don't have much stroke volume. So if you blunt their heart rate, the patients feel awful. 
because they're relying on their heart rate for cardiac output. Remember, stroke volume times heart rate is cardiac output. And if you take away that heart rate, that's what they're living off of. Um, many amyloid patients, because there's actually systemic involvement, they have neuromonal insufficiency, can't mount the blood pressure, and the amyloid fibers invade the nerves, frankly, don't tolerate ACEs or ARBs at late stages. That being said, we have shifted the natural you know, history in many ways for some of these patients that often we were recognized early, and they're often in a transition for hypertension and develop amyloid on top of that. And so they end up tolerating some of these agents if you catch them early enough. But if the disease is systemic, invades the nerves, can't mount blood pressures, they're not going to really tolerate these traditional therapies we may find uh, many of our patients on. Um, but essentially, what is amyloid? So there are actually 24 known types of amyloid within the body. There are two main types that affect the heart. Um, amyloid light chain, amyloid transthyretin disease. Um, amyloid light chain disease comes from the bone marrow, essentially is an immunoglobulin. We all talk about immunoglobulins these days and antibodies. Um, but part of the immunoglobulin, the light chain portion, your green breaks off, misfolds, and forms this amyloid clump or fibroid, which is kind of like a waxy deposit um, that can then invade different organs. Transthyretin is actually a tetramer protein coming from the liver that dissociates into dimers and then monomers. They misfold to form these amyloid clumps. Okay, but essentially they have different precursor proteins. Um, and they can lead to different disease manifestations predicate towards different organs, whether it's light chain, hereditary mutant variant transthyretin disease, or wild type transthyretin disease. Common here is carpal tunnel syndrome and obviously the cardiac manifestation. The light chain disease, you can get purpur, macroglossia, renal involvement, intestinal involvement, a lot of cases with alternating constipation, diarrhea, IBS like symptoms. Um, hereditary transthyretin amyloidosis, often these patients have a sensory motor neuropathy, and then wild type transthyretin amyloidosis, they often have spinal stenosis, back pain. They can also have a neuropathy. It's just not as profound as those ones in the variant uh, one. Um, and so these are some h &E stains and then also conga red staining of uh, endomyocardial biopsies, of the one I perform myself, a patient where you have these waxy amyloid deposits in the interstitial of the myocardium. You zoom in from panel A to B, and you see these have amyloid fibers depositing between the cardiac myocytes. You're not going into the myocyte, it's between the myocyte. And that's important uh, when we get into imaging. You'll then do conga red staining and then under polarized light, you see the apple green biopharyngians. And that's what this is right here, okay? That can come up on medicine boards, cardiology boards, heart failure boards. This is what it is, okay? Um, often we will think about patients with a low voltage EKG. You know, that is the classical teaching. Um, and there are many things that can lead to a low voltage EKG, not just amyloid, uh, but essentially you can't conduct a signal through that diseased myocardium. And in this case, because it's fiber, the amyloid fibers are depositing between the interstitium. But rather than say low voltage, it's more of a discrepancy between the LV thickness that you see on echo versus the voltage um, on EKG. You'll also get this pseudo infarct pattern where this QRS is fractionated because that same patient two months prior had a normal voltage EKG, but still had a pretty thick septum. And then, you know, if you go two months prior and hindsight's 21, you're like, huh, despite this really thick and ventricle, even a normal voltage here should have been, you're like, wait a minute, does this patient have amyloid? Less than 40% of patients with biopsy-proven disease actually have a low voltage EKG at the time of diagnosis. So I often think it's a marker of advanced disease or just chest wall edema. Um, you don't form amyloid, <laughs> cardiomyelitis in two months and get a low voltage EKG. Uh, it's a matter of just comparing, you know, and thinking outside the box, like what is this voltage in relationship to the echo? We have advanced cardiac imaging, cardiac MRI, it's come a long way. And, um, you know, in terms of someone with like a, a normal heart here, you see, right, the view of what you're seeing here is looking down to the left ventricle and the right ventricle, that's a crescent shape sub -stru structure here. Um, this ventricle is normal wall thickness. And we look at delayed enhancement patterns and essentially healthy myocardium is going to be black and unhealthy myocardium will be white tissue in this area where the black myocardium should be on MRI. And you don't really see any fibrosis or delayed enhancement here. But in patients with amyloidosis, you get uh, sub-endocardial uh, diffuse deposition, non-vascular pattern, basically not in the territory of just one artery. And then it can become a full thickness scar. As that happens, we actually don't know why the gadolinium is hanging up there, okay? Nonetheless, it happens. You get kind of a scarring phenotype on the MRI. 
it changes our native T1 time. So when you go from 1,000 milliseconds to in really disease states, close to 1,200 milliseconds, but that is not specific for amyloid. We can see this in other hefka phenotypes. But one thing I would want to draw your attention to is the extracellular volume. Remember, I mentioned that those amyloid fibers deposit in the interstitial space between the cardiac myocytes. So in someone who's healthy on cardiac MRI, if you look at the volume of the myocardium that's extracellular, it's a less than 30% in most people, okay? If someone has an infarct, there's a lot of scar deposition, collagen deposition, um, you'll get those fibers deposit there. And that in that territory, when there's an infarct, that extracellular volume, because of the collagen deposition, um, that forms the, that wall thickness on, on, uh, on imaging can rise to about 30, 40%. But with amyloid, when you have a thickened myocardium and we look at the extracellular space versus intracellular space, it's about 50, 60%. And that's because those fibers are depositing between the myocytes. And along with that, there may be collagen deposition along with those amyloid fibers. So it's not just the fiber, there's a, probably other processes going on there as well that we just can't fully characterize on MRI. And nonetheless, it leads to elevated ECVs. Um, and this is important because actually prognostically, in terms of uh, disease outcome, um, ECV actually performs best in first diagnosing and tracking outcomes in patients. Okay, so there may be a point at which we just shift from looking at MRI patterns with just delayed enhancement to incorporating ECV. I think there's some chats coming through. Oh, sorry, never mind. Um, okay. Um, carpal tunnel disease and a question stem on your boards. Um, you may hear about someone who had a thick heart and then they have carpal tunnel disease and you're trying to figure out what to do next for the patient. So it is common among amyloid patients. Those fibers do go do the risk. Um, and in one series, in all comers um, with cardiac amyloid doses, or actually uh, in all comers referred for carpal tunnel releases um, in this series out of Mid-America Heart and Cleveland Clinic, is that 10% of carpal tunnel releases stayed positive for amyloid. And that predates a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy about, by about six to seven years. By and large, if I talk to my patients who are being referred for a worker for cardiac amyloid dose, I'm like, have you ever had carpal tunnel surgery? Like, oh, yeah, I definitely did. Or I had a trigger finger surgery. Same kind of principle. Um, so it is something in the history that should cue you off. <clears throat> so the thought is in a lot of centers is should we just be doing routine Congo red standing on anyone um, who has uh, going for a carpal tunnel release? Um, because maybe you'll pick up cardiac amyloidosis even sooner. In theory, it should work. It's really hard sometimes to reach across disciplines and make this automatic for our health system. But it is a, it is something that a lot of us try to do. Um, you know, hip or knee arthroplasties. Remember, in a lot of cases, these are diseases of aging, and so some of our patients will have hip surgery, and knee replacements. And if you look at the cartilage from those knee replacements or hip replacements, you actually find amyloid fibers. More so with transthyroid disease as opposed to light chain uh, cardi uh, amyloidosis. But this is a series out of Columbia that showed that you know, patients with a history of hip or knee arthroplasty have a higher risk of cardiac amyloidosis. So it is something that I ask my patients about. We'll quickly touch on amyloid light chain disease and you know, the incidence is about eight per million per year. 70% is lambda mediated, untreated median survival is about 13 months. Um, <clears throat> The workup includes looking at free light chains, serum, and urine amino fixation. You can look at prognostic markers, anti and P and troponin, and the differential is an MGUS, wild type of hereditary transthyroid amyloid. The treatment is barred from multiple myeloma, where we try to target the clonal plasma cell. And for many years, the mainstay was cytoxin, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, okay, so cyborg D. Um, but there's this new agent on the block called daratumumab. That is an anti uh, CD38 uh, monoclonal antibody that targets these clonal plasma cells for destruction, both through uh, the um, you know the complement cascade, opsonization with macrophages, and direct apoptosis. And this was studied recently in the Andromeda study that showed daratumumab on top of standard care cyborg D to target the clonal plasma cell um, was superior to cyborg D alone in achieving. Um, 
end organ um, improvement. And they looked at patients both with renal uh, AL amyloid, cardiac AL amyloid. And for the cardiac outcomes, we we're looking at improvements in NT pro BMP or improvement in NYHA functional classification. Um, whereas progression was a worsening in cardiac biomarkers in NYHA class. And those patients in the daratumumab group, um, frankly, had greater response, okay, a net response. Um, in terms of anti BMP and NYHA classification. And so now DARE2 has become, you know, the first agent specifically approved for AL amyloidosis and in many ways is now standard of care. Uh, so let's get to transthyretin disease, which is um, what many of you often will refer patients to me uh, for evaluation. Um, and I have to rule out amyloid light chain disease, and we do have therapy scores, so I, it's important to diagnose that also because DARE2 has been such a game changer. But transthyretin amyloidosis comes from the transthyretin protein, TTR. It is prealbumin. Okay, it's the same thing. It's 127 amino acid protein that transports thyroxin and retinol binding protein. And that's where it gets the name, TTR. And that gives you what the function of the protein. Um, normal, stable, tetramer conformation. All right. And then abnormal, misfolded monomers. So they break apart in the monomers, misfold, and form these amyloid fibers. Um, and that can happen with age. Um, we used to call it senile, not the best term. Um, so the uh, appropriate term now is wild type um, amyloidosis, transferring amyloidosis. But it can happen earlier in life due to a genetic mutation or variant. And we try to say variant TTR now, um, in which and these variants all have an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Um, the true prevalence of ATTR cardiomyopathy is unknown. In one autopsy series of those patients over the age of 75, 32% had ATTR deposition, whereas those patients under 75, only 8% had ATTR deposition, but only 20% had a pre-mortem diagnosis of TTR amyloidosis. So it speaks to it being a disease of aging. Um, and 16% of patients in one series from Columbia were referred for TAVR for seborrheic stenosis. Remember, aortic stenosis is also a disease of aging had comorbid cardiac amyloidosis, okay? Um, and on some of those aortic valves, you can actually find TTR deposits. We try to do non-biopsy diagnosis. In the past, we used to do endomyocardial cardiobiopsy. It will always be the gold standard here. Always will be the gold standard. I can't reiterate that enough. But when compared to endomyocardial cardiobiopsy, using technetium 99M um, bone tracers, um, meaning R-phosphate or uh, DPD, which is often used in Europe, but we had to switch to recently due to a uh, supply chain shortage. Um, these bone tracers are utilized because the TTR fibers are very calcium added. So you inject someone with this tracer, and normally, if you don't have cardiac amyloid, the things in your chest wall that should light up are the things with a lot of calcium. Okay, those are bones. Our moms told us to drink milk okay, for healthy bones, and you'll see your sternum, and you'll see the ribs, okay, but in those patients with cardiac amyloidosis, okay, those calcified TTR amyloid fibers will light up also, so you see the outline of the heart here, and that's where we get technetium pyrophosphate scanning, that's the theory behind it. We don't know why the amyloid fibers buy calcium, by the way, but that's how it works, and as long as there's no detectable monoclonal protein, based on serum-free light chains or serum and urine immunofixation, meaning you're ruling out amyloid light chain disease, this is 99% specific for ATTR cardiomyopathy. Um, and that's because the AL fibers can be weakly calcium out of it. So sometimes you can get a fake out. There was actually a recent series from Europe showing that maybe it's even more. So you have to be very, very strict about that hematologic workup to, um, uh, to rule out light chain disease. Uh, the serum free light assay, which we use in our um, health system, uh, the normal ratio for capital lambda light chains is 0 0.26 to 1.65, but the kappa oligomer is actually larger than the lambda oligomer. So if you have a reduced GFR, it's hard to ex excrete that kappa oligomer. And so the you'll have to, your numerator gets larger naturally as the GFR goes down. So you have to do a, an adjustment and that renal adjustment most by, by and large is shifted about 0.37 to 3.1. And as long as the immunofixation studies are negative and someone with a reduced GFR with the, with, within this range, for me, I'm comfortable saying I ruled out a light chain process. For those who don't see as many patients, I do encourage always enlisting the help of the hematologist. This is a systemic disease. 
you know, these are some of these processes. We should re reach across the aisle to our colleagues and get their input here, okay? Um, and this is actually showing different grades of uptake. Zero down here is no uptake. One is less than rib uptake. Two is equal to rib surrounding rib uptake. And three is brighter than the surrounding rib. And that's how we qualitatively score pyrophosphate scans, okay? Semi-quantitative measures are drawing a region of interest over the LV, counting these white pixels here and comparing it to the contralateral chest. And a ratio greater than 1.5 is considered to be diagnostic for ATT or cardiomyopathy in the absence of a monoclonal protein or a visual score of two or three in the absence of a monoclonal protein. And this is another uh, slide highlighting that um, those patients with a higher heart, heart to cardiolateral ratio where that ratio of pixels is greater than 1.5 actually have more survival over time. Nonetheless, these are planar images of the chest wall. Okay, and that, remember the, the left ventricle is filled with blood. If your tracer is actually in the blood and not in the myocardium, you're actually gonna light up in a similar pattern here. So we do spec imaging to make sure that the tracer is within the myocardium, okay, as opposed to within the blood pool. So you wanna do an audit of those images. And so we do technetium pyrophosphate scan with spec, single positron emission, computed tom tomography to make sure that the tracer is within the LV and not the blood pool that would cause a false positive. I cannot reiterate enough the number of scans I've been referred without spec that actually it turns out to be blood pool. When I feel like something something's just amiss, okay, and we end up biopsying the heart and it's not there and we go back and realize spec wasn't done. Or if I find like a grade two uptake in a heart to control lateral ratio of 1.2 is either potentially early disease, or maybe we didn't fully distribute the tracer into the myocardium. So this is not a perfect scan. You have to time things out appropriately. Um, and there's a lot of protocols out there on how to optimize a scan and make sure that this tracer distributes so you can do your diagnosis. Worldwide, um, amyloid in the US, you know, frankly, is a disease of older individuals, often 70 plus. There's a, used to be a male predominance. Um, it can be found often in African-Americans. Um, wild type is very common, about 50% of disease. The most common genetic variant we see is called V122I. And this, this mutation has predominantly a cardiac phenotype. Around the world, there is actually a younger age of amyloidosis due to transthyroid amyloidosis with a male to female equal predominance. They can be asymptomatic um, for a large period of time, um, even in their youth. Um, but the common mutation is uh, V30MET. It's found in Portugal, Sweden, Japan, um, Spain. Um, the phenotype varies by region. There's some epigenetics at play, but often here in Europe, it's, you know, you have neuropathy. The minute these patients come to the Americas, we kind of get a mixed phenotype of cardiomyopathy and neuropathy, and these patients are often found in their 50s as opposed to their 30s. These are a number of the mutations I mentioned previously. They're, you know, uh, that I talked about that can have different degrees of cardiac, neurologic, or mixed presentations. V122I is a mutation we often see in African Americans, that people of Afro Caribbean descent. Um, and even in our Latin American population within New York, just patterns of migration, mixing of populations, this is actually a pretty predominant mutation I find in Hispanic populations here in New York. <clears throat> Um, but I60AL is, this is an, an Italian uh, mutation, T60A is an Irish American mutation, um, V30M late onset is often found in our Brazilian community, so it's important to take a history as to where patients are from, and you'll start to recognize the patterns, and so I take a really specific history as to where patients' um, ancestors were from. Uh, three to four percent of our African American population, or even our Afro Caribbean population, uh, carry this V142I uh, mutation, used to call V122I, based on the 2020 census that affects about 1.5 million people. We don't know what the penetrance is, but that's a number of people that have potential to become afflicted and can pass on the disease. Um, that being said, African Americans are underrepresented in clinical trials and they receive less upfront care, and so. In order to address disparities, we have to be very vigilant and aware of what's going on with our patients and what the background could be so they get the right type of care. You don't want to miss a diagnosis, say, they just have hypertension. Oh, they have chronic kidney disease. There could be something else at play. Uh, 
So we want to address disparities and offer precision medicine and health equity to our patients. Um, and so they get the right therapy. Um, so essentially early detection is crucial. Um, this is looking at a distribution of patients with hospitalized heart failure um, with an EF of uh, greater than 50%. And what we find in overall um, patients with hospitalized um, heart failure and those with an EF greater than 50%, 15% will ultimately be diagnosed with cardiac amyloidosis, okay? That's a large sum. And at this point, across the U.S., from data from the Get With the Guidelines Registry, what we know is now is about 50 to 60% of our heart failure admissions are actually half path as opposed to half rep. So if you take 15% of that, that's still a huge chunk that potentially could have cardiac amyloidosis. Um, this is actually uh, from a case series that um, we published in Jack out of here in Mount Sinai, led by um, one of the EP fellows at the time last year, looking at trying to find other ways to diagnose early. And a lot of these patients with cardiac amyloidosis might have arrhythmias or need have conduction abnormality, might need a pacemaker. Um, and so we're looking at patients who are referred, all comers above the age of 60, um, who need a pacemaker or ICD implant and looking at chest wall adipose tissue and then uh, doing conga red staining under polarized light. And we're we were finding patients actually have amyloidosis. And then that we work backwards and ultimately do a pyrophosphate scan and diagnose cardiac amyloidosis and get these patients onto therapy. So there's a big push to try to find these patients, not just through a traditional pathway of an echo, we have other ways to pick them up potentially within a cardiac population. This is a series out of Hopkins that actually looked at of all patients with HEFPEF who are hospitalized. They did endomyocardial biopsies in this series. And again, about 15% of patients ultimately had amyloidosis. Okay, so that's even on biopsy studies. Um, it used to be that, you know, in the absence of therapy, if someone was healthy enough and not too old and didn't have too many other comorbidities and had cardiac amyloidosis, we would offer cardiac transplantation. That was our only option to reach for. And in the modern era, patients get transplanted for cardiac amyloidosis as opposed to other types of cardiomyopathy, they have equal survival at this point. So it is still an option for patients diagnosed later who may not res respond to therapy um, and because we have good options for them. <clears throat> but um, early detection is crucial because we have other therapies now on the market. Um, I wanna talk about TTR stabilization. And essentially I talked about a TTR tetramer um, Tefaminus is the game changer, first in class agent here that selectively binds to that binds to those T4 sites on the TTR tetramer and stops it from breaking down so you can't form amyloid proteins. This was tested in the ATTRACT trial. Uh, patients had, could have wild type hereditary TTR amyloidosis, NYHA class one, two, three, and there's a composite endpoint. And essentially, the patients who got Tefaminus were placebo one better survival, okay, at 33 months. Um, and those patients treated when they were least symptomatic had the best bang for their buck in terms of getting benefit from the agent. They realized most benefit. It's still a progressive process. We think we only stabilize about 60% of that TTR protein. So 40% of that TTR protein could still destabilize and cause progressive disease. And so patients will have a functional decline over time, but just not as rapid as those patients randomized to placebo. At this point now, Tavamus was uh, approved in 2018, 2019, I believe. I've had patients now on treatment for four or five years and they're doing great, okay? We used to think if we saw a patient with amyloid, we'd hope to see them in a year. So um, when the right patient, this is a great drug. It is expensive. We get a lot of assistance for our patients. Um, it costs $260,000 a year because there is a monopoly on the product right now. Um, and that's something we're <laughs> always talking to Pfizer about. Um, but there are assistance programs and we get to reduce costs for our patients. And most of my patients have a zero dollar copay. So future, direct future directions of stabilizers. Uh, another agent that's being um, evaluated in clinical trial that we were a part of in the Mount Sinai Health System was Acaramidus or AG10. Um, and this is based on a genetic mutation that stabilizes that tetramer so it doesn't degrade. And this may achieve 90% stabilization of the tetramer. So potentially, potentially better than tefamidus, okay? There's no head-to-head -head trial, but essentially in those patients 
on this drug, if you stabilize the protein, your serum prealbumin should go up with treatment. And those patients who got HE10 had an improvement in their TTR levels at day 28. Concentration went up, okay? That means they're getting stabilization. We test in the attribute trial, the phase A results were actually null. We only looked at six minute walk test at 12 months, but we're eagerly awaiting the phase B results. We just wrapped up the study and maybe we'll have results in June uh, from the company looking at the change in death in cardiovascular, cardiovascular hospitalizations and need for heart failure visits with those patients who got this agent. Um, and this was just talking about how the phase A results were kind of null and we're waiting for the phase B results. Um, and now, uh, just to uh, land the plane, we can talk about TTR silencers, RNA-based therapy. This is where the field's really heading. It's really exciting. Um, so we can produce this TTR protein, and at some point in its lifespan, it's going to degrade and turn into amyloid. TTR silencers, rather than a stabilizer, was, you know, allows that protein to be formed, and then you need to stop that tetramer from breaking down. Silencers stop transcription. So you can't form the TTR tetramer to begin with. And there are two agents, ionotericin and patericin, now a third agent, putrezoran, that basically target that mRNA for cleavage. So you can't form the tetramer to begin with. So downstream, you can't make amyloid because there's nothing around to eventually degrade into amyloid. Uh, Patisran is an IV, is drug given through an IV infusion every three weeks, so 0.3 mg per kg. This is from the dose finding studies. Um, it silences production or transcription of the mRNA for about three weeks. Um, in the hepatocyte. Um, and after that, three, three weeks, the levels begin to rise. And inotericin also leads to a similar uh, suppression in serum TTR levels uh, by silencing transcription. They were tested in neuropathy studies. And what you need to glean from this slide is uh, the neuropathy patient, the investigational agents are the blue lines here, placebo is the black line here. And looking at neuropathy scores, patients who got Batista had an improvement in neuropathy scores versus placebo, inotericin less progression in neuropathy. Um, nonetheless, in these patients who got patisran in cardiac sub-studies, we found there was an um, improvement in wall thickness and in preservation of global longitudinal strain, and over time, a reduction in nt pro BNP. And so this was first studied in a neuropathy population. It's a systemic disease, but the FDA, we did studies based on neuropathy versus cardiomyopathy. We did the Apollo B study, and we were part of that at Mount Sinai, our health system, um, and patients were randomized to Patisran versus placebo uh, for a number of months, uh, looking at cardiovascular endpoints in these six-minute walk tests and KCCQ scores, and the, it hit its primary endpoint, improvement in six-minute walk tests and secondary endpoints, including Kansas City um, questionnaire improvement scores, but the composite of mortality, cardiovascular events, and change from baseline six minute walk test just missed statistical significance. About 25% of these patients were allowed to remain up to FAMINIS in the study. The FDA is reviewing the data and will probably get a determination about this drug's approval for cardiomyopathy uh, Q3 of this year. Um, Future directions of sale, uh, silencers. So I mentioned that inotericin, or sorry, the t is an IV infusion every three weeks. It's kind of cumbersome, especially for our older patients. Inotericin, while it works, it has a high side effect profile, potentially with thrombocytopenia and glomerular arthritis. And so there are, um, there's a next generation version of the t called Utrezoran, where there's a conjugate platform delivered, easier uptake into the hepatocyte leads to a sustained reduction in um, serum TTR levels, much like patisran. This is called utrezoran. It's an injectable given every three months. Um, so no pre-medication, no infusions every three weeks, just a sub -Q injection every three months. And along with reducing serum TTR levels, we found in cardiac sub-studies, it improved NT-pro-BNP. Um, that's over here, NT-pro-BNP, um, along with improving neuropathy scores. This is now approved for neuropathy. The ongoing, there is an ongoing cardiomyopathy study um, with this agent. Nonetheless, these agents are expensive, but Medicare generally covers this drug, okay? So this is kind of the next generation for a lot of our cardiomyopathy patients, and we're hoping it should, is also effective for patients with just age-related wild-type amyloidosis. I'll skip over this one right here. And lastly, CRISPR um, is, there's a lot of, excitement about two years ago in the New England Journal when a paper looking at gene editing technology 
um, when the technology was published in the New England Journal with a whopping six patients, just six patients, but essentially we're using CRISPR technology um, to basically take um, an interrupting um, sequence um, uh, of DNA that can be incorporated into the hepatocytes DNA through an, AP an APOE particle. Um, and it gets delivered there, introduces a non-coding sequence in the TTR gene within the hepatocyte, so it can't be translated or later transcribed, and it leads to a sustained reduction in serum TTR even a month out. They've expanded this study um, to include more patients. I think we're a number of years away from this being prime time, but it is exciting. Um, and I, I will probably be about five or six years away from really getting results from this. Um, I wanna show you the effectiveness of silencing technology. This is one of my patients. He has a French and German mutation, I-127 valve, leads to neuropathy and cardiomyopathy. This is all public knowledge. He was diagnosed with having HIV neuropathy for years. Um, he had multiple spine stimulators. He was in a wheelchair. He used to be a competitive cyclist. And he lost everything that he thought he was before. Um, he developed pedal edema. He was defecating on himself. And after about 10 months of silencer therapy, this was him walking around. He now sends me pictures of leaf blowing. He's off to Paris this week uh, with his partner. Um, he's enjoying his life again. And his whole goal is to get back on a bicycle. All right. And um, there are guidelines for the use of uh, how to manage cardiac amyloidosis from our heart failure societies. Class one agent is Um, But in, in select patients who actually have a genetic mutation and comorbid neuropathy, you can get a silencer at this time. Down the road, our silencers will be approved for cardiomyopathy. But our unanswered questions today are, what are the long-term implications for myocardial structure and function of myosin inhibition? What will be the role of ICDs for hokum in the era of myosin inhibitors if you get rid of all the LV wall thickening potentially the scar? Can imaging be used as a biomarker and endpoint in clinical trials for ATTR and AL cardiac amyloidosis? Will we start just treating patients based on the extracellular volume with these therapies? Will there be a difference in response and outcomes in patients who get the stabilizers versus silencers? And will that difference be di also realized in patients in wild type versus variant TTR? So this is kind of a summary side of where we are in this, in terms of the modern era of hef hef and phenocopies of what treatment therapies we have available. When I was in medical school, I graduated in 2010, 13 years ago, we didn't have any of this. So amyloid, we now have tefaminus, patisserin, uh, Butrizoran on the market, um, Acraminus, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about soon. Pipeline is really exciting for amyloid. Similarly, pipeline is exciting for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And of course, for HEFPEF, we now have SGLT2 inhibitors, and Paclofosin, as our um, as our mainstays of therapies and select populations we can use in trustones for naloxone. Um, this is our landscape of HEFPEF and restrictive cardiomyopathy trials within the Mount Sinai Health System. If you guys have any questions or want to refer a patient, by all means, reach out to my admin, Francesco Santiago. You can also reach out to me directly. And with that, thank you for your time. Just hit one. We'll take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitter, for that incredible talk. So many promising therapies that are already making so many changes for your patient population. So thank you so much for um, teaching us about it. Uh, it is one o'clock, but I think Dr. Mitter um, is going to stay on if we have any last minute burning questions. Uh, I had a question. Hi, I'm Angie, uh, one of the chief Hi. residents. Thank you for that amazing talk, Dr. Mitter. And it's so cool to see like the frontiers of what's going on in the field. I think taking it back to the diagnosis side of things as, you know, general internists as primary care doctors um, in our practice, should we be, you mentioned that the early detection um, of amyloidosis is very important. And should we be looking, you know, in our patients with carpal tunnel syndrome, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, should we be thinking about um, the risk factors for cardiac amyloidosis even before they become symptomatic from that? Because it sounds like it the neuropathy uh, of the carpal tunnel often precedes 
um, the cardiac manifestations. Is there any recommendation? I know not really a guideline, but recommendations around, you know, we see patients in our clinic whom we refer for surgery. Should we be routinely asking for that biopsy and that staining? Or um, does there have to be something else, like whether ECG changes or something else that we suspect proteinuria um, to kind of put it together? So sure. No, it's, a, it's a very good question. It comes up all the time. And, you know, and you know, if you're referring to referring to carpal tunnel surgery, you see it in their chart, you know, maybe that's your kid to sit there and say, do you ever get tired when you walk around? Do you have any chest pain or trouble breathing? And then initiate a workup. You know, a lot of these patients, you know, it's undiagnosed disease. You know, it's not like the ventricle thickens overnight, it thickens, thickens, thickens. There's like a tipping point to use like a Malcolm Gladwell analogy. And so you can order the echo, but always ask for an echo with strain. And it's very easy to get strain now because CMS has a separate billing code for strain. So we get reimbursed for strain. And that's a big thing that, you know, we're trying to protocolize throughout the Mount Sinai Health System that patients get an echo with strain. And that can help pick up what's going on potentially and raise the index of suspicion. Is there comorbid amyloid? Is it just hypertensive heart disease? Is it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So look at the history you know, nip, he, he, hip and knee replacements, carpal tunnel, and maybe just order that echo, you know, especially if they have any type of fatigue or dyspnea. There's no harm there. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Angie. I actually have a quick question, Dr. Mitter, about, you know, the side effects from the sarcomere target, targeted therapy. I think you mentioned briefly that there um, were a couple of side effects of rapid reduction in the ejection fraction on the patients that were, you know, uh, started on the uh, Afikamtan. Mavicamptin. Uh, Mavicamptin. Ma- there you go. Yeah. Um, is there any way that we can identify the specific patients that are, are at risk for that side effect? Did they have any, you know, analysis, post hoc analysis, looking at whether or not those patients were also on beta blocker therapy, specific beta blocker therapy, or um, there's still unknowns of what exactly, what kind of patient is at risk for uh, the rapid? reduction in ejection fraction? Yeah, that, you know, it's a good question. I don't think we have exactly a good predictive tool, but AI is, maybe chat GPT will tell us next week which patient <laughs> uh, when it goes through this stuff. But that being said, it actually goes into the drug because because there's a lot of drug-drug interactions with Mavicamptin potentially through the CYP pathway, um, it, it would lead to a higher effective dose of the drug. Um, and so you want to be mindful of that. And so those are some of the patients we have to be very cautious about, um, you know, who may have a redu- greater reduction in EF at just such a small dose because they're actually seeing a higher effective concentration of the drug. Um, the numbers are small still, and those patients who drop their EF to very concerning levels clinically don't know what it means. When you withdraw the medication, the EF goes back up, okay? And the, but the septum thickens again and the grading comes back. So we'll learn more about these patients. Um, not so I'm really excited about Afikamtin because this drop in EF is not something we're really seeing as much in the phase two studies. Got it. Thank you so much. Now, this will be the last question because I know Dr. Mitter, you're very busy, but Dr. Kwok asks in the chat, what is the incidence of amyloid in Asian, South and East um, Asian population? So good question. Um, I don't have the definitive numbers, but um, Tefamidus is approved for neuropathy in Japan, actually. Not cardiovascular, it's also approved for neuropathy at a lower dose, 20 milligrams. The FDA didn't wasn't too enthusiastic about that data when it was presented in the US um, a number of years ago, but it is there. The V30M mutation is a common mutation found in, in the Japanese population. I think, you know, there's an epidemiologic transition happening in a lot of countries um, in Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa even. And we're realizing that more, more patients are living long enough to actually develop cardiac amyloidosis. And they're not, it's no longer a tropical disease or infectious disease, or they're living past their ischemic heart disease or ischemic burden and potentially get into their 80s, 90s, and we're realizing they're the amyloid. So I think those nationwide studies and registries to track what the instance is in these populations, that will be coming in the next in the in the coming years. And as the technology is easier, non-invasive technology is optimized to diagnose we'll be able to fully appreciate it. We don't really know it that much here, but, you know, and we we think it's actually much more common. It's the sleeping giant. Um, 
And we need to do a better job of diagnosing here within the United States and North America. But as that technology you know, spreads throughout the world, we'll get better population country level specific data, um, especially in different countries, um, what the instance is. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitter. Thank you everyone for joining us on this Monday afternoon. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Mitter, for uh, spreading your amazing expertise and knowledge. It's always a pleasure learning from you. All right, thank you everyone. We'll see you next Monday uh, for another session of Grand Rounds. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks so much.